Yes, we can start. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And this is Asima Zara, and I'm a veterinarian. And I am presenting uh, Holy and Soli, my research work, uh, my, uh, all the research work from the last five or six years we have been conducting in a school of public health and zoonosis uh, in a university that's Guru Wanga Dev between the Amla Sciences University, Good Boss of Punjab. And my main focus will be on the pervasiveness of the medicinal resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, and the borderline adolescent resistant Staphylococcus in the community and the food of animal origin. Why I will be discussing about the food of animal origin wholly because we know there are multiple sources that can transmit the antibiotic resistance from one source to the another. So there are multiple factors that are responsible. And the food is also one of the important factor that is responsible for the dissemination of the antibiotic resistant isolates. And using a uh, like a health health uh, saving, uh, human saving drugs medicines which we use to treat the highly infectious diseases and we are using those drugs in the, uh, in the animal farms and they are developing a resistance and that resistant gene are transmissible to the other human beings which then become resistant to the other uh, antibiotics and uh, in, there are a lot many infectious diseases that cannot now be treated by any of the antibiotics. Just for example, if it is an MRSA, now MRSA is showing a vancomycin increase. Vancomycin is the only drug used for the vancom MRSA. Uh, treatment and now it is actually showing the increase in a vancomycin resistance uh, as well. So how the food and I'm come in this presentation I will be comparing how the food is actually an important source of such antibiotic resistant genes, especially the Staphylococcus aureus, including the community as well. It will be a comparative analysis. In this presentation, I will be presenting only the data of my results, which I be uh, presenting here, not from the other studies. Before I start, every one of us know about the antibiotics and the resistances we are facing this time. Now, the antibiotic we use in a, uh, in a farm industry, in the animal farm industry, we use for the sustenance animal production framework. When obviously, there are not many infectious diseases that can't be treated without the antibiotics. But there are other diseases as well that don't require the antibiotics. Compared to that, I think the Humans, the community, but in the community, the medicine is over the counter available. And that is actually the important factor, the human self-medication that is actually contributing to the antibiotic resistance. There are a lot many uh, um, microorganisms that are getting the antibiotic resistance genes, E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter, and many other pathogens. But here I will be discussing about the antibiotic resistance Staph aureus. Staphylococcus aureus is one of the most important foodborne pathogen as well. It was first, uh, the uh, MRSA, the Methicin Resistance Staph aureus, was first identified in 1961. And thereafter, it was uh, isolated from each source you can imagine, from the environment, from the food, from the community, from the hospital settings, from anywhere you can imagine. So it has also been isolated from the raw milk and meat products, from the food industry workers, hospital environments, and the community settings. Community settings include like, the, the, like our keyboards, mobile phones, um, the outside game sports, everything. There are the countries that are, there is a highest increase in the consumption and India is a leading country. In the 2010, it was just 3.2. Now it has, by 2015, it doubled, like a 6.5 scale of the 10. We have done a lot of the research on the antibiotic resistance where I'm a co-author or I'm a first author and these are the papers we have published so far. So I will be discussing only antibiotic resistance staff audience, origin from the third. Methicillin resistant staph aureus and the borderline oxacillin resistant staph aureus. You must be aware of these two names, especially the MRSA. BRSA is like it's now emerging uh, concern because in hospital settings, now the cases are more on the borderline oxacillin resistant staph aureus as compared to the MRSA. Now, the, the difference between the two is if you find the staph aureus from the food and it is carrying a MEC A gene, then we identify it as a MRSA. We label it as a MRSA, irrespective of whether it is oxygen resistant or susceptible. Likewise, when we go for the B or SA, the main concern of for us is the MIC value. The oxygen resistant MIC between one to eight microgram per ml, but it varies. There is no accurate and uh, definition given so far for the BOR, B, borderline oxygen resistant staph aureus. Now, how I made the classification of BRSA, I will, I will be discussing in the next slides. No matter what your sample size is or in which location you are, the pool, there are the studies where the pool prevalence was found that it's, it, it doesn't vary much from the one or one. Yes, 
prevalence do vary from one location to the another location. But if we get the pool prevalence of the respective countries, it doesn't vary much. For example, it is like um, most of the countries represent the prevalence star for us 25%. And when it comes to the MRSA, it is 3.2%. Same was put in our studies as well. Not exactly same, but yes, percentage was like 25 and 30%. So variable level of prevalences have been reported in the different studies, and these variations may be due to the difference in handling practices of the raw meat and the milk samples and its geographical location variation as well. So if we are estimating the prevalence of the source in the one point, we must be aware that the same data, same figures can't be implemented if I am actually locating that antibiotic resistance at the different locations. The, since I said that oxygen MIC variation was way too much between the isolates they are taken from a different food samples, you can see I isolated the oxacillin like resistant isolates from the chicken, chivum, from the milk and the community. The wide variation of oxacillin you can found only in a chicken and the community. It very much correlates with the studies with the antibiotic usage in the India. Since we know that chicken, uh, chicken uh, are the and the food samples that have been frequently uh, found very much, very much loaded with the antibiotics. And here also, when we isolated the staff forest and checked for the oxacillin, the variation was very high. And that was comparable to the community, where community was a major factor contributing to the oxacillin variation. Since I said there is no stern definition so far given for the borderline oxygen resistant uh, staff audits classification, and you will find if resistance is more than four, if minimum inhibitory concentration, MIC, is more than four microgram per ml, then you will see the isolate is oxygen resistant. It will be considered as MRSA if it is MEK positive. Otherwise, it will be MEK negative, not considered as MRSA. Now, there are the, some studies that report the BRSA uh, value, MEK negative, although resistant, with the four to eight microgram per ml, but it's MEK negative. Those isolates will be considered as BRSA. But there are some reports also that consider the four to 16 microgram per ml as a borderline of the resistance but these isolates are MEK positive. Having a MEK gene doesn't necessarily, it has been seen in the study that having a oxygen resistant more than four microgram per ml does not necessarily mean it is an MRSA. It can be the borderline oxygen resistant staff or is with some other mechanism uh, of action, but not MEK. -A. If MEK -A is present, that doesn't mean that it will be resistant to the four, uh, to the antibiotic oxygen. So the classification of this is not clear, but if it is MEK positive, then MRSA. If it is not, then PRSA with the range from 0 0.5 to the 8 microgram per ml. This is a flow diagram that actually gives the classification of the PRSA. Why I'm discussing the PRSA very much? Because so far, there are not much of the studies on the borderline oxygen system, especially from the food samples. The, sam the food that we offer to the patients, with the care to the kids, to the neonates, to the elderly patients, and there we fail to treat them because they are showing the oxygen resistance, although not carrying a packaging. So the treatment regime will get difficult for, the, for such patients. So the reason why we have the uh, borderline oxygen resistant, resistance, but not carrying a MAC gene, may be because of the number of the reasons. Maybe it's a MAC-A variant, like MAC-B, MAC-C, or maybe it's a hyperproduction of the beta-lactamate, or there's a, some altered binding capacity with the modified penicillin binding proteins. In order to just uh, nullify the hyperproduction of a beta-lactamase, to just exclude that possibility, co-amoxclave antibiotic distribution test was performed. It was found that isolates from the chewing were not whether they were hyperproducers, because if it, they are hyperproducers, the clavulinic acid will inhibit the beta lactamase and it will show the normal oxygen resistance. But if it not, then the story will be different. The chewon, the isolates that have been taken from the chewon, that is a, uh, actually a meat from the goat, that's a goat meat, and those were susceptible beta lactamase hyperproducers. No problem with that. But when same was done, so isolates from the pork, the pork and the community settings were showing completely a different results. They were not beta lactamase hyperproducers, they were MECA negative, so the possibility that are left that they will be carrying a different variant of a gene, and that is what is a concern. PVL is a cytotoxic uh, gene. It's a cytotoxic uh, gene, basically, or a uh, protein, pentin and leucocidin, and its association with the MRSA is what makes it really dangerous. So far, it has been reported in the community-associated MRSA. These are the MRSA that are reported only in the community settings. For example, there is a person who is infected with the MRSA but has never been 
was hospitalized before. So how that person get actually the MRSA if it has never been hospitalized? Because the source of the MRSA main was the hospital acquired MRSA. You mainly get that MRSA from the hospital settings, not from the community settings. So if I am getting the MRSA who has never visited the hospital, those would be known as a community associated MRSA. And it is really putting the people in the danger because when I go out there, basically, I am carrying a resistant gene that is easily transmissible from one pathogen to the other pathogen. So it quickly transmits from one because the segment that carries the gene is very short. And as long as it's short, it's easy to transmit. Co-tramosol resistance is also found in those isolates, and it is very much concerned in the HIV patient because not many diseases are treated with the co-tramosol um, in the HIV patients. So if you have staff orders, if they have staff orders, and it is co-tramosol resistance, so the co-tramosol resistance will actually Maybe uh, it will just decrease the competition of the other bacteria left the staph virus, and when they get the staph virus infection, it really creates a mess in the HIV patients. Second and soft tissue infection, very difficult to treat. The PVL gene was found in the medicinal susceptible staph virus that was comparable to the BRSA, no matter whether it's MEK or MEK positive. Although the before, it was reported that PVL is positive, PVL is more prevalent in the hospital acquired MRSA, then followed by the community associated MRSA. Now we can see it is actually well present in the M medicinal susceptible staph virus as well, and it is a pathogen effector. Now it's in a food, I'm taking that food. It's PVL positive, much more susceptible staph virus. Now I'm mean, having another food which was contaminated with the MRSA. Now in my gut, there is MRSA as well, but that was PVL negative. Now they are in a commensal association. There can be an exchange of a genes. And now I am having MRSA that is PVL positive. So if I get unlucky anytime, I get the infection that will be acute. But when uh, from uh, our study for the three and the four and five years, where when we uh, conducted the study that was published in the number of the research papers, we found that the community settings were having approximately three times more MRSA. We found, in fact, more MRSA isolates on the notepad, on our mobile phones, uh, on our hands. Uh, it was very frequent as compared to when we compare that with the meat and milk samples. Sorry from the isolates from meat and milk samples. Likewise, the odds of finding the, the, like these isolates, MRSA, it was five folds greater when contrasted with the food of animal origin, whether it is milk, whether it is meat, whether it is product, community was exceeding the MRSA number as compared to any of the meat products. So the likelihood of discovering the PVL positive MRSA was higher already in the community settings than a food of animal origin. Now, what exactly food is doing that in community were already with the higher load. Having a control on a food so on the community side may, may, decrease the load on the food side because I am having the employees who are working in the um, farm. If they are positive MRSA, they are actually transmitting that to the food products. If I am not judicially using antibiotics, I am creating the commensals that are mixture of everything and they can create a new pathogen. And since we are facing that coronavirus, how that is created, when it was reported, it was reported like 2011 and now we are facing the consequence because of the mutation it was having, because of the genes that were mingled. Same as here. This is the first plot of a logistic regression model where I actually uh, try to find the odds of ratio finding the different where, between the community and the meat samples. Since I said before that community was actually showing a more uh, odds of ratio finding the pathogens as compared to meat and meat products, but meat and milk products are actually additional factors. Now, if community and I am in the community, I'm in positive, I'm handling the food, it is transmitted. Now, I gave that food to the other person, like a shopkeeper, that gave food to the other person, the other person gets that MRSA. So, food acts as a source of the transmission, and food itself are actually creating a gene if we are not careful using the antibiotic in the farm. In fact, in the European countries, a lot of antibiotics are banned. Like not many. There are some very important antibiotics for the human for saving the human life that are completely banned. But such regulations are can't be implemented. I'm not saying that same regulation must be implemented in India. It can't be. But some life-saving drugs must be banned for the using the farm animals. Uh, there's one thing to note that uh, in the last graph that uh, some odds ratio are very wide. It may be because the sample size was less compared to when we compared with the community. Community MRSA was very high in number. In this graph, you can also see the community MRSA. It's like quite high in number as compared to the MRSA, BRSA we find in a different mean samples. There comes a vancomycin MIC creep. Actually, we know that MRSA infections are still being treated by the vancomycin. Now we are in a scene where we observe that MRSA isolates are showing increased susceptibility, reduced susceptibility to the vancomycin. That means increased vancomycin is uh, load is required, dose is required in order to treat the MRSA uh, infected patients. And this increase 
all the NSS receptor wave range, but it doesn't increase like two to four microgram per ml. That means we are very close to get that MRSA resistance of vancomycin as well. And this increase to the in, reduce, sorry, this reduced susceptibility, yeah, increased need of a vancomycin dosage, and that is known as a vancomycin MIC group. And it's, it was very frequent in the isolates when we conducted our study. We find that vancomycin MIC group in almost each of the isolates, where higher was in community and the milk samples. And this problematic, this is problem because when patients are MRSA isolates, they display the MIC creep, they will show the delayed response to the treatment, there will be high mortality rates, there will be a longer time hospitalizations, and the expenses, everyone knows how much expensive it is to be hospitalized. In our study, we don't find any vancomycin or any of the uh, isolate positive for the van A gene, but what we found is that the most of the MRSA are showing the vancomycin MIC values higher. And this is a positive, and uh, there was a strong uh, relation of the vancomycin MIC with the type of the samples. As I said, it was very high in the milk and the community settings. It was not only the vancomycin or the MIC values I'm, uh, I'm discussing. We also found the correlation of the different determinants with the type of the sample. Like, we, if I take the tetracycline resistance, there are that K, L, M, and O gene. Uh, different kinds of a gene that are responsible for these kind of a resistance. In case of the Chivan, in case of a Chivan, uh, Chivan that is a goat meat sample, we have a TETK gene. And this TETK gene was more frequent in the uh, Chivan samples. Likewise, chicken and swab samples, that MLA, ML and K was frequent. In fact, LK was there and M was almost in every isolate because K and M, they are very small and easy to get from the one isolate to the other, another isolate. That may be the reason. And we know but there are a lot many papers in India, basically, that represent the high intake of the tetracycline in the chicken industry, as well as in the food samples of the chicken as well. That may be the reason that I found the isolates having the tetracycline gene M, L, and K in the chicken samples. Also, the chicken was showing the higher level of the ERM B, um, and ERM B and C was in chicken and uh, swab samples. This is the logistic regression model I use to deduce the different odds ratio, and you can see the wide range of you. Uh, your, for example, in a third graph, first, second, third, the uh, lower uh, part, you, know, you, you can see there is a resistant genes, TET M and the Chivan, uh, TET M, TET K, that's a tetracycline, for a tetracycline resistant genes. You can see TET M for the Chivan is showing uh, odds ratio, positive odds ratio compared to any other meat sample. Likewise, for the BLAZ and the swab, and these are the regression models showing that how the sample type are showing a variation with the, the with the presence of the gene. So gene is present with respect to the sample type. Likewise for the MLST sequence typing and the spot typing. When we did the MLST typing and the spot typing or typing of these isolates, I will highlight only the most pandemic type of the status isolates we found here. In chicken sample, sequence type 5, spot type 3, 4, 4, 2 was prevalent, while as in milk and the community sample, sequence type 2, 2, spot type 2, 2, P005 was prevalent. Why am I talking about the sequence type 5 and sequence type 22? Because these are actually the pandemic staff for us type. Sequence type 22 was only reported so far in the England, and now it's here in the mid samples where we found that sequence type 22 is also here. Likewise, for the chicken sequence type 5, these are the pathogenic these had been isolated from in the hospital settings, from the urinary tract infections, from the respiratory tract infections, from all other kinds of the infections that, are ex that we expect. These have been so far isolated from the hospital settings. Now they are actually present in a food, a food, a meat, milk, which we daily consume. So you can expect how much it is transmitting from the one to the one person to another person. One more thing is that these sequence types were associated. For example, sequence type five, it was with the SSC MEC type second. SSC MEC type is like you can say a genome for island. It's an island of a genes. So it's a bigger one. It can transmit from the one pathogen to the another pathogen easily. So sequence type five was more frequently associated with the SSC MAC type second. But when I come to the SSC MAC type uh, five, in our case, it was with the SSC MAC type five. So you can type five with the SSC MAC type five, not two. And this SSC MAC type five is comparably, comparably of a smaller size. So it can carry the sequence type five and SSC MAC type to the another isolates and then to the other, other, other isolates. So now you can see how we are creating a mess for ourselves. So you can type five that was rested to the bigger island is now available on a smaller island, island and easy to go. Same is with the sequence type 22 that was reported in the England and uh, not in most of the countries, and now it's India. Maybe it's global transportation and the global travel and, uh, here and there. This is responsible for the uh, dissemination of the sequence type 22. 
In conclusion, why I was all discussing about this antibiotic resistance in a food, because I just wanted to show how much it is in a fold of the animal origin and what we need to control. When I compare with the community, yes, it is higher and higher in the community. It's higher and higher in the community as compared to the food of animal origin. Yes, if we control on the community side, maybe it has an impact on the food of animal origin side. Because if I put every pressure on the food industry, on the farmers not to use the antibiotics, we have to feed the, feed the population as well. So controlling it and feeding the population, we have to take side by side to see whether it is beneficial or not. Only then we can. But so I can see the control on the community side can actually reduce the burden on the food of animal origin side. So that can be easy to control, not a burden to the farmers, and we have to actually feed a larger population as well. Thank you so much. This is all. If you have any questions.